Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. Now, today we're going to be having a look at some of the uh, launch control techniques we can use in race applications to try and get nice, fast, consistent standing starts. Useful for either circuit racing or drag racing. And of course, if you're that way inclined, you can also use it at a set of traffic lights. We don't mind. Before we get into our webinar, though, just wanted to cover off uh, what's been going on around HPA over the last week. Uh, we've also got another giveaway that I'm going to cover off as well that's a really exciting one we know you guys are going to love that now first up we're going to carry on with our cooling sagas on our Toyota 86 so ho hopefully before this webinar started you've been able to see our black V8 86 sitting here on our mainline dyno finally got it back up and running so we're actually hoping Ben might be able to get this out to the racetrack over the weekend and uh put in a few laps and see if the changes that we've put into place have made any difference with uh, the cooling for both the engine as well as our diff. Now the diff as I touched on last week has been a bit of a controversial topic after I posted up a photo on our Instagram and uh, instantly got a lot of feedback from those who follow Gail Banks channel thoroughly. So I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit more insight into what was actually going on there. So if we head across to my laptop screen for a moment. Uh, this is the, the diff out of the back of this car. Uh, hopefully the actual crown wheel and pinion are up to the power we're putting through it. It's not the most powerful engine in the world. We're putting out around about 450 horsepower but of course this diff originally came out of a car designed to produce 200 horsepower. So yeah, we're definitely beating up on it pretty hard. What you can also see here is that we have replaced the factory Torsen style LSD uh, with a Cusco 1.5 way clutch plate style style LSD and uh, we quite often get asked about the difference between a 1.5 way, a 1 way and a 2 way LSD and uh, simply put this is just the action of the LSD to lock up and uh, supply torque evenly I guess you could put it uh, to both axles under accelerate, acceleration versus braking and uh, particularly with a 2 way LSD that will provide the same amount of locking force when uh, engine torque is applied or also uh, when you are hard under brakes or engine braking. Uh, so essentially what it tends to do is it locks both wheels together a little bit under braking. Now the drift guys tend to like this because it helps them initiate a drift. Uh, for us in a circuit racing application though this often isn't ideal because what it tends to do is make the car want to uh, push or understeer on corner entry. So the 1.5 way LSD has different ramp angles on the uh, power side and the overrun side and what this means is that under acceleration the diff will lock up just like we want it to but on overrun it's not going to have quite such a vicious effect. A one-way LSD on the other hand uh, tends to provide no locking action on overrun at all. So a lot of this comes down to your car setup as well as your personal uh, preferences. So that's what we've got going on in the back here. But what I really wanted to show was uh, this Cusco, LS, uh, Cusco rear diff cover. And this is our extended billet alloy Cusco diff cover. And what it does is it extends the oil capacity or it increases the oil capacity by about half a litre. The problem though is what we can see here is we kind of have this uh, 90 degree angle here uh, and we obviously have exactly the same happen down in here where we can't see. And Gail Banks' videos which everyone was uh, quite uh, keen to show us, uh, sort of basically his theory is that uh, with the oil being pushed, uh, let me just draw, try and draw, pushed hard into this corner and then it has to sort of run off that, basically puts more work into the oil and actually tends to create more heat where obviously what we're trying to do is remove the heat from the oil. Uh, there's also some concerns around the ability for these uh, aftermarket rear covers to displace the oil and put it into the locations where we want it. Obviously we need to lubricate that pinion gear. Uh, and not discrediting Gail Banks' videos at all, his, uh, his theory and also his experimentation is really, really complex. I can't argue with that. Uh, what's important to understand though is we can't also take uh, one experiment on a particular diff and then uh, say that that's basically an across the board result for every differential out there. Uh, but the important thing to also note here is why we really wanted this Casco rear diff cover is because, as we can see here, uh, it makes it really easy for us to plumb our oil cooler. So uh, we're actually not relying or not expecting to rely on this diff cover on its own.
phone to keep our diff cool. Uh, instead, what we're going to be doing is adding an external pump and an external oil cooler. So this is where we're really seeing or expecting to see those benefits. As we can see in here, I've also got a little oil temp sensor. So now we'll actually know what the diff temp's getting to. So a question that comes up straight after that is, well, if we didn't have a diff temp sensor before, diff oil temp sensor, how did we know it was overheating? Well, simply put, it was pretty easy to tell because the uh, housing was getting so hot that it actually began melting one of the aftermarket bushes uh, that holds the diff into the chassis. So that's never really a good sight when your uh, nolithane bushing is actually melting and dripping out of the car. Coupled with this, the oil was actually getting so hot, it was essentially boiling and blowing out the overflow. So uh, after about 30 minutes of hard driving, uh, we actually got to a point where the car was pretty damn close to catching fire, we think. Uh, the oil was flowing out of the overflow and onto the exhaust. And uh, I actually stopped driving because the car essentially filled up with smoke. So there's our theory as to why we think it was getting hot. Uh, yeah, sure, it'd be nice to have some data, which we now will have. Uh, but of course, uh, the results were pretty conclusive. Now, what I want to show you is uh, the sort of diff cover that Gail Banks is advocating we use. So this is actually a Z1 Motorsports diff cover that's going in our 350Z. And what we can see here, this is actually cast rather than billet. And hopefully on the camera there, you can see that there's a nice smooth rounded shape to this. So uh, the idea here is that this will help the oil flow up the back of the of the ring gear and flow across onto the pinion. So uh, that's kind of probably uh, a superior design to the Casco, but we'll wait and see. Uh, what we do know is that that Casco diff cover has been out in the wilderness for about as long as the Toyota 86 chassis has been. And we're certainly not hearing reports of people uh, having diff failures as a result of fitting that. Uh, so we're, uh, we're prepared to roll the dice there a little bit and uh, just see how that all works out. Right, uh, give me a second here. I'll just head back across to my notes. Uh, oh, actually, no, the next thing I wanted to talk about was on our Toyota 86, uh, we've just also uh, upgraded to a Motec C125 dashes. Head across to my laptop screen and we'll see how that's all going in. Now these aftermarket dashes can be quite problematic to fit sometimes, particularly on a late model car, making them kind of neat uh, and unobtrusive. So what we're actually using here is a product made here in New Zealand by Motorsport Electronics. And uh, they made this dash kit for the local New Zealand Toyota 86 racing series and uh, what it does is it replaces the factory gauge cluster completely and we can see uh, it's a 3D printed uh, cluster or, or a plate I should say that the C125 nicely mounts in. It's been covered with some uh, carbon wrap just to give it that sort of carbon look and then the factory uh, plastic cover goes over the top of that and it all slots into the dash exactly like factory. There's also a nice adapter harness that comes with this which literally makes it a plug and play uh, application and we've got some of the nice functions that we can monitor through the factory CAN bus so we can monitor things such as all the wheel speeds, uh, brake pressure, we can also monitor uh, steering angles so some quite advanced stuff that in a lot of cars you're going to have to spend a lot of money on sensors to add. That's all available and then on an additional CAN bus we're getting all of the data out of the Motec ECU that uh, transmits across uh, all of the information onto that dash. So there we basically now have a central logging hub so we can log the chassis data as well as everything that's coming out of the Motec ECU. Now what I want to show you that is because the reason we have just fitted this dash is we will also be fitting a Motec telemetry system. So uh, this is probably something a little bit advanced at the club level uh, sort of uh, club level of motorsport but something we see a lot of at professional motorsport levels and uh, we're going to be producing some content around this for uh, both webinars as well as on our social media channels. So how that works is I've got uh, this little transmitter, this sits in the car and this is a 4G, uh, it's got a 4G SIM card in it so this is just a cellular modem essentially, uh, connects up to our dash via Ethernet and then uh, is just powered and it's got an external aerial so that transmits the data and then we have a Motec T2 receiver which sits in the pits and uh, this again has a SIM card in it so it's a cellular modem receiving all of that data and this transmits to our PC and then we can view the data live as the car's going around the track. Uh, now the nice function with this is it allows someone in the pits, hopefully a data engineer, to actually monitor everything and if something's starting to go outside of normal operating parameters this allows them to inform the driver and again really this is 
also just comes back to allowing the driver to concentrate on his or her job and drive the car and not really worry about what's actually happening with the car. So again, uh, we'll have that in hopefully in the not too distant future and uh, we'll keep you up to date with our progress there. Uh, now, another thing I wanted to talk about is we are expecting a new addition to the HPA vehicle fleet in the not too distant future. Uh, we are going, we're still sort of up in the air about it, we are looking at purchasing a, a Subaru Vision 7 STI Spec C RA. Uh, we've been asked for quite a long time now for some more content around open source reflashing and the Subaru platform is very, very popular both here as well as overseas. So uh, this is going to be a perfect candidate for some reflash uh, webinar content, some reflash practical uh, worked example and then uh, we're also going to have the ability to run aftermarket standalone ECUs in that car as well. So uh, this will probably become our workhorse for a little while while we're waiting for our 350Z to get back up and running for some of our public webinars. So again we'll keep you up to date with that. Uh, we have just started a new giveaway and this is one that we know is going to go down really really well. Uh, we have done one with Haltech previously and it was very popular. Uh, uh, this this time for the next couple of weeks we are giving away a Haltech Elite 950 along with the Haltech WB1 wideband CAN controller. So I'm just going to talk about these two products for a second and then I'll tell you how uh, you can get involved. So first of all the Haltech Elite 950 and there are uh, a fair few products in the Haltech Elite range. We've been using the 2500 which is uh, the top of the line in our Nissan 350Z for a few years now for our webinar. Uh, the 950 is aimed for those people with 8 cylinder or up to 8 cylinder engines so we've got 8 injector and 8 ignition outputs. Uh, it's, it's a pretty advanced ECU running all of the Haltech Elite uh, software and software features that uh, we've already demonstrated through our webinars. In particular one of the nice functions with the Haltech Elite is the self learning functionality. This applies to a variety of different aspects of the ECU's operation. Uh, one of the key ones there that I made use of uh, quite a lot on our 350Z is the self-tuning of the fuel map. So how this works is it basically looks at your target air fuel ratio map and it looks at the actual air fuel ratio coming in from the wideband air fuel ratio sensor. Anytime there's an error it basically applies a short term fuel trim into a table. Uh, so we've got a three dimensional table so it's not applying an overall trim. That trim is dependent on load and RPM. Uh, so basically you can take your car out or on the dyno driver and allow the self-learning to make corrections and then once the correction map is fully developed you can then apply that to your main fuel map. It actually works really really well. I will warn though that these auto-tune or self-learning functions they still aren't a band-aid for not tuning your car properly in the first place and you certainly can't ex expect to plug the ECU in with no base map, go for a drive on the racetrack and expect everything to be fine. It's not quite like that but what it does do is a really good job of making small adjustments if there are some errors in your map and then of course the ability to apply those to your main fuel map makes things really really easy. All right, the other product there is the new CAN based wideband controller. So uh, this is something we actually saw when we were over at Haltech at World Time Attack last year in October. Uh, it was a product that wasn't quite released then so we weren't allowed to talk about it. Uh, CAN based widebands, if anyone's followed us for a while you know, you'll know, you probably know that I am a huge fan of these. Uh, traditionally the old school wideband controllers were all analog voltage output devices and what this results in is a 0 to 5 volt output generally that uh, is scaled across your air fuel ratio range. Uh, problem though is that uh, this is very sensitive to any ground offsets. Very easy to have a ground offset when you're wiring these in. If you have that and you don't know about it, it's going to mean uh, that there's big inaccuracies in the actual air fuel ratio data that your ECU is seeing. Obviously when we're looking at something as critical as the air fuel ratio, we don't want error, any error to creep in. So the CAN based unit on the other hand, uh, in ensures the integrity of all of that data because uh, the air fuel ratio data is transmitted over a two wire CAN bus uh, so there's no chance of voltage offsets upsetting that. Uh, this particular unit waterproof as well it is potted uh, you can mount it somewhere in the engine bay and it uh, just connects via the four pin plug uh, CAN uh, harness that's pretty common in uh, Haltech products uh, uses the 
the Bosch LSU 4.9 Lambda sensor, which again is pretty popular, pretty common in uh, most aftermarket ECUs now. On top of this, uh, the, we are also including one of Haltech's uh, premium unterminated engine harness kits. So this goes from the ECU out to your engine. It does require some wiring, as it says, it's, it's unterminated. So this allows you to modify and make that harness up to suit. Uh, the premium kit, though, does have a couple of nice features. First of all, there is a built-in relay box. Uh, so you don't have to go and wire in additional relays and fuses, which is probably one of the more time-consuming parts of building a custom harness and there's also a nice firewall grommet where that harness is going to pass through your firewall out into the engine bay. Uh, so it's actually probably a good time to just talk really briefly about the options you've got when it comes to installing one of these ECUs in your car. So obviously that is one option where you want to build your own harness. This allows a lot of flexibility in making the harness exactly what you want it to be. However, it is time consuming and if you are working on a popular engine, then Haltech also offer up terminated harnesses for these popular engines so uh, this comes with all of the connectors on the harness already it's uh, nicely sheathed it all looks professional and it's then s pretty close to plug and play you'll still have to hook up power and grounds etc but it does make installing an aftermarket ECU really easy if you are running one of those engines that is supported and then the last option is again for a few popular vehicles there are plug and play adapter harnesses so uh, these are a shorter adapter harness that goes between your Haltech Elite ECU and the factory ECU header plug. So this really does literally make it into a plug and play affair. Uh, one thing I'll just talk about here, if you are choosing between these, uh, a lot of people ask us, well, why should I go for one over the other? In general, what I would say is if you're looking at a relatively standard installation and your factory harness is in good condition, then if you have the option of a plug and play adapter harness, that's your quickest cheapest and easiest way to get up and running. However, on a lot of the uh, popular engines now, let's say SR20s, maybe RB series engines, they are quite old now and the factory harness can end up de deteriorating because of the heat in the engine bay. So uh, often in these cases, you may actually be better to replace your factory harness because you can get reliability problems that come in because the connectors have all become brittle and fallen apart. All right, I've talked way too much about this product, but it is a great giveaway. We are also pairing it up with our engine tuning starter package that gives you our EFI tuning fundamentals, understanding air fuel ratio course, our practical standalone tuning course, and membership to our private online community. And you can get your name into the drawer by heading along to the link that the guys will drop into the comments now. Uh, this, this giveaway has only been running for a few days, but uh, plenty of time to get in there, but why not do it right now? There are a few other options you can and go through as well to give yourself a few more uh, in entries into that drawer as well if you follow the simple instructions on that link. Right, if we head across to my laptop screen for a second, uh, this is an Instagram that I put up a few days ago and I just wanted to talk about this uh, just briefly because uh, we did get a few comments on our Facebook page actually in particular, not, not so much on our Instagram about, uh, about this. So we have gone here on our SR20 VE engine that's in our 350Z. We have chosen a a Bosch Motorsport drive-by-wire throttle body. Obviously the SR20 of this generation uh, traditionally uses a cable throttle, uh, but we've gone to drive-by-wire throttle and there are a couple of reasons for this. But before I get into those reasons, uh, when we talk about drive-by-wire throttle, we automatically end up getting a few people ask us about the downsides of drive-by-wire throttle, thinking that uh, drive-by-wire is laggy and potentially unsafe. I just wanted to clear that up because it really isn't the case. Uh, often a lot of people think that drive-by-wire it, it results in some lag because they've driven an older generation factory drive-by-wire car and it had a mushy kind of feel to the throttle response. Now that's really a case of the factory tuning as opposed to any limitations with the hardware. Uh, so really these days, particularly with aftermarket uh, ECUs running drive-by-wire throttle, there really is no limitation, there is no lag or latency that you're going to actually notice. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the drive-by-wire throttle body can essentially move just 
just as quickly as you can move your foot on the throttle. Uh, in terms of safety as well, these are incredibly safe. And I would say that there are almost certainly more accidents and deaths have occurred because of a cable throttle that has become jammed than a drive-by wire throttle body that's gone out of control. The reason for this is there are some really su smart safety strategies in the ECU. The ECU tracks the throttle position and also tracks the throttle target. And if those two don't match really carefully, it has the ability to run into a limp home mode where it can instigate a low engine RPM limiter just to prevent the engine uh, running away if the throttle ends up jammed at wide open throttle. Uh, in both the driver's foot, foot pedal as well as the throttle position as well, there are double sensors. So there's two sensors in each place and these basically give redundancy. Essentially, if both of those sensors don't match, then again, the ECU knows something's wrong. So actually incredibly safe. Now, why we've chosen this for our 350Z is because drive-by-wire throttle allows us to really easily tailor the throttle opening to our target or preference. So what this means is we don't necessarily have to stick to a linear translation between our driver's foot pedal position and what the throttle's actually doing. And this particularly with a high-powered turbocharged four-cylinder engine allows uh, the flexibility to change the torque output to suit the driver's preference and the amount of traction available. Hopefully, what that's going to mean is that we can uh, produce a car that's much easier to drive, particularly when traction is limited. And we can also have multiple throttle maps as well. So we can have one for uh, dry track and a one for a wet track. So we can just dull down that throttle resp the response again to make the car a little bit more drivable. Last thing is we are also going to be using this to provide auto blipping on the downshift for our downshifting using a sequential gearbox. So that just allows again the driver to concentrate solely on actually controlling the car and uh, the driver's not going to have to worry about uh, manually blipping the throttle uh, in order to match revs. Alright, last but certainly not least, if we just head across to my laptop screen again, while we were at PRI this year, we managed to get the chance to chat to Aaron from Bully Dog. Uh, and this is uh, something that's called a lot of controversy out there in the aftermarket at the moment, particularly diesel tuning obviously, is uh, the removal of a diesel particulate filter or DPF. Uh, these are an emissions control device. The DPF is there to remove diesel particulate matter out of the exhaust and basically reduce the uh, smoke output from diesel engines, one of the downsides of a diesel engine. So we're seeing a lot of tuners and enthusiasts these days removing the diesel particulate filters from their vehicles, thinking that the, they're going to gain power. And generally what this is actually doing is causing a whole bunch of problems with diagnostic trouble codes. Uh, so what we do in this video is we talk to Aaron and find out a little bit about the actual reality of whether you're going to gain performance with removing the DPF and we talk about their aftermarket motorsport orientated diesel particulate filters. So these flow better than factory and they're also uh, interestingly a little bit cheaper as well. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about that head across to our YouTube channel and while you're there make sure you subscribe. Alright guys, uh, give me a few moments here and we'll get started with today's webinar.